Kate and I are here to share a little bit of our Friday morning poetry ritual with all of you today. About four years ago, Kate and I were having tea in Concord, and I believe saying having tea is significant also, so please keep that in mind. <laughs> Kate asked me if I was writing much poetry, and I told her, unfortunately not, because there were so many other things going on in life at that time. And so Kate suggested that we begin a Friday morning ritual where we would pick a topic of writing a poem and take a little bit of time, 10 or 15 minutes, to sit down and write on that topic and come up with a poem and then to share it with one another as we have been doing now for four years. Some of the topics have been interesting, serious, and zany. gosh darn crazy, <laughs> zany. <laughs> Such as donkeys, barbies, squirrels, angels, plumage, estrogen, lady slippers, labyrinths, <laughs> conquest, <laughs> cheese, and more. And it's been one of the best things, I'd say, yielding many poems between us, the exchange and the outlet and the expression and the contemplation of life and things and of performing prayer through poetry. I think we've learned many lessons from the act of sharing these poems with each other as partners and friends, and we recommend it to all of you, uh, no matter what you write, poetry, songs, stories, We'll be offering a workshop in May on this topic here in Hopkinton to talk more about this Friday morning poetry exchange. We are different kinds of writers and performing artists. Our poems are different in length and language and format and how we focus on topics. Um, these are, these might not be our, our necessarily our best and brightest. They might be interesting because of the topics that we picked today, uh, which we're excited to share with you. We like the topics and we want to share them with you and find all of it interesting and representative of the ways that we carry stories in us. And now we would like to tell some of our stories through our poetry to you. And we're going to begin with the topic of Barbie. Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> well, we decided to, to start, actually it was one of our very first poems that we traded, mm -hmm. and we were inspired by, as many of you know, Ellen Schmidt, who has a fabulous song, I'd Like to Be a Barbie Doll. Mm -hmm. And that, um, I think that's important because it shows the triangulation of inspiration. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, actually, Ellen's song, and then you said, we should write a Barbie poem. Mm -hmm. So of course that's what we did. So um, I uh, would love to read for you. My, my Barbie poem is called The Barbie Code. When I was growing up, my parents didn't let me have Barbie. And um, that was uh, a problem. <laughs> 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 the Barbie Code. When my mother forbade me Barbie and my father flung his retort, you're just jealous. What exactly did that mean? <laughs> I was seven or thereabouts and didn't really care, but they did. Now I know. To my mother, Barbie was bosomed sexuality, a hard plastic hormone for purchase that, <laughs> that would change me into sneering adolescence and bring boy trouble too early. My father saw a woman's body beyond reproach, sleek and without mystery, so unlike my mother and all the women we knew. <laughs> no offense, Mom. <laughs> and a placid face that did not inquire too closely or demand things hard to come by. My mother saw the opening of a world of complication. My father saw the blissful closing of a world of complication. <laughs> My mother saw the woman doll. My father saw the doll woman. For her, it was about me. For him, it was about her. Over at my friend's house, Barbie was old and sheared or tattooed by ball points. Her finery was swallowed up by the toy chest or the vacuum. She was the patient victim of our creativity, our remorseless, fierce, hilarious minds. We were seven, subject to no gods but ourselves, our whims, and time. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thanks. Well, Kate, at my house, I was able to play with Barbies, and I played <laughs> until it was far beyond being cool for someone in my <laughs> teen years. <laughs> I loved Barbie, but I experienced some shift as I became a mother and then thought about Barbies with my own daughters as I was raising them and then not feeling quite so keen on them. <laughs> and so I went back to this feeling when I was writing my poem about Barbie, uh, reflecting uh, more of a mother's perspective in uh, bringing Barbie world to young daughters and uh, I see what happened when I was writing also is I went back to my psychological background as well um, and in um, looking at society and the messages that we give about beauty and its importance mm -hmm. and also um, in how we regard those that we don't consider beautiful or they don't consider themselves beautiful and how they are taken care of in our society. This is called For the Love of Barbie. Barbie, it's not that you are beautiful that bothers me. You standing statuesque in the middle of my four-year-old daughter's birthday cake, which <laughs> drapes about you like the skirt of a long-ago southern belle, and everything about you to the eye is picture-perfect. It is more of this fleeting thought I have as I begin to cut and serve your elegant pink and white puffy dress on plates to all these little Barbie starstruck molting girls. And then, of course, you'll eventually be needing the fashion wear, the miniskirt, stilettos, the lowriders, the thongs that you will begin to build as necessity in your high tower closet when one aspires to be a beauty just like you. So you will be looked upon and loved, the coveted goal of humanity, that you must have these finest clothes, quaff your hair, each strand banded just so in place, first thing in the morning when the mirror is there to greet you. Looked upon and loved as you apply mascara to your lashes, which flutter above your lids of makeup blue, as you dazzle your brightest whitening striped smile and notice all the eyes around you, that pulse, that dilate, that door, and you glow as you come to know that you will be indeed loved for what you look like. As I will likely go and dutifully buy you all those supermodel clothes so my daughter will feel this plastic love in her little world of make-believe. While there are girls growing into women all around you who continue to play the Barbie game by staring, cooing, admiring, aspiring, and pointing their one accusing finger to those around not deemed Barbie, Barbie beautiful. Like the one who drags her feet upon the sidewalk, the one who is shunned in school, the one who is hiding under her bed cutting or overdosing on something strong enough to convince herself that she just might be loved because she does not feel beautiful like you. I see this all as only fleeting as I pull you out like treasure from the cake's core. Look upon your frosting-covered body, see my daughter's eyes sparkle in their wanting, not knowing where her eyes will lead someday. To perhaps join the ranks of the Barbie wannabes who never stop the search within their mirrors, or to join those that never fit the mold of Miss America society, that stare upon the sidewalks, or the shattered mirrors, or the hospital ceilings. I hand you over reluctantly, knowing Barbie, that the cycle never breaks with you, only mirrors do. Only mirrors do. Mm -hmm. And then one day, <laughs> we decided to write about lady slippers. Uh, and uh, that triggered for me, thinking about lady slippers, uh, the memory from childhood, finding them deep in the woods. And another thought that came to me when I sat down to write that poem quickly was I had recently been to Emily Dickinson's house in Amherst, 
uh, I, I believe, and uh, how beautiful the gardens were there. And looking inside and imagining Emily, who was confined a, a great deal, confined herself uh, within her home, and uh, just had a thought of imagining her leaving uh, in a blast and going out into the woods and discovering one. What if Emily Dickinson decided to one day get up and leave the safe predictability of it all? The rich colored walls, the long window panes bending to light, the old walnut desk by her bedside, and the quill pen right there waiting. And what if she pulled out her tall green garden boots the ones for steering through large garden puddles, maneuvering amidst the brown spotted toads with the small coiled snails barely moving. And she pulled on those boots and then clutched at the black iron door latch to give a brave pull and dash out before changing her mind and go running for the forest in the cool green late spring rain. I am sure her throat would catch, her heart would pound as she would delicately trudge through the damp earth, the dirt and the bushes and the trees all blending and bending into her wide-eyed senses, with no longer just hearing the daily predictable hum of house sounds, the servants, click of heels on the floor, the clatter of pots and pans in the kitchen, the bees breezing and bumping at her windows. Instead, she would hear a chorus of birds from the treetops above who consented to sing in harmony, the clucking of jay green frogs peering from some nearby pool, the whispering of the wind and the groaning of the old wild branches. To trip upon this world, finding her lungs so full of delightful he heaviness of breath, she would likely go further into the depths of the green and brown and wet and the scent of wild grass and sweet pepper bush and skirt around the tall lime green curl of ferns which would tickle at her ankle, spot an unexpected flag of pink flower upon the ground ahead unfurling its solitary beauty, waving from the ground, calling, bringing Emily to full halted stop while her chest would heave at the brilliance of this sight with this tiny being waiting to meet her. Emily's hand would unclench then to touch the velvet pink of lady slippers so slightly, to recognize such bold fragility of beauty, to understand this is what was calling her. And then, of course, Emily would sink to the earth in her white dress of sacred, kneeling she'd stop to stare for a pleasant eternity of a moment and kiss this small pink flower goodbye and turn with a wide smile, unleashing her hair from its buckle. Emily would run wild in those green rubber boots and her muddied flowing white dress back to the predictable welcome of home. She would grab at the latch with great force, burst through the doors like a mad bull bolting forward up the stairs in all her happy fury, pausing to catch her breath at the doorway to her quiet room, thrust herself upon the chair at her waiting desk, grab her quill pen and ponder how to begin. Mm. Oh, I love that one. I love that one. I, um, I think the sequence of the way that this, the lady slippers happened, the, the, the trading of these poems, is that I read Cheryl's. So our, we, we send them off Fridays, Saturdays, sometimes Sundays. <laughs> and and I, I read Cheryl's, and I think I was put into that dream days of Emily, who is, for me, sort of a um, mythic figure, probably for a lot of you guys, too. So I grew up in Maine, and um, we had lady slippers growing in the woods. And I would never forget the time that my brother Dan came in with a lady slipper for my mother. And she was delighted, but she said, you know, Dan, it's against the law. <laughs> 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 the, the lady slippers, but it was one of those dear, like, boyhood moments, which was soon to flee. <laughs> so the sense of time. So uh, my poem is just called Lady Slippers. A half dozen Cinderella's fled yearly through our woods and dropped in their haste these astonishing shoes. Fleshy, pink, and so frankly beautiful as to touch vulgarity, a heel's width between proposition and prayer, humid and chaste, vestal and yielding. 
At twilight, the pine shade was barren, but one night's charms and dews brought them up from the needles. Finding them in the fresh hour after sleep, the cool of morning, you were still arrayed in the silken dress of your dream. Half waking, you spied them, touched by wands of shadow, and knew without thinking, the clock strikes now. I notice we're popping peas here, so should we stand back a little? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Both of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's a poem. <laughs> we love poetry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I would rather be shelling peas than popping them, <laughs> given my choice. <laughs> We move on to spiders. <laughs> Where else would you go next, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, so we picked spiders for a topic one day to write about. And when I thought about spiders and what will I write about with this, um, I thought about the spiders who coexist in, in our house that we allow in there to be with us unless they get, you know, yay, big and furry, furry. and then we have other plans <laughs> for the spider. We transport them out there. Um, but uh, it made me think of coexistence of uh, a woman and a spider. And this poem is not necessarily autobiographical on either side. <laughs> but I, I did, I thought about the perspective of woman as well as spider. And um, it's uh, a bit more, I would say, uh, empathic and uh, anthropomorphic. And something um, also interesting uh, b happened when I was writing this poem, because that's how my plan. I was uh, writing about a woman and a spider, but as I was writing without intending, um, it seemed to um, become, on some level of awareness, a bit of a, a metaphor for uh, larger in life things like organizations and uh, the potential abuse of power, like in countries or governments or religions, um, where mm -hmm. there is uh, alleged coexistence until someone makes a wrong move. It's called the spider in my house. I like the company of you, or so I think today, in the corner, quietly resting with your eyes half shut. I like to think you are always sleeping, and I am being so compassionate, allowing you to stay here in my kitchen. Little do I know you are listening, paying attention, whenever I am on the phone or at the door. I never worry about you over there while you sit and stare at your latest victim that keeps you barely alive, wrapped in its precious hand-hewn silken sack that probably took you hours upon hours to complete. Now you don't have to worry about your tomorrow for the moment, with your nursery of children all staring at you in their hunger, with limp, weak mouths and large, starved eyes, wondering when you'll call them next to come and feed. They will choose to rest until they hear you and then use the last of energy to fiercely fill their stomachs until the threat of emptiness once again pervades. I never know a thing about this constant endless cycle of your family's survival of day to day. I never know that you are quietly watching me worrying about things like this. While today I think I am so, so busy doing my best to save the world and have no idea about the fragility of your own. No wonder, then, you mock me when I speak of things like stopping war, feeding the country, amnesty, cleaning the earth, and world peace. All the things I put in an envelope and toss in the can of the one on the street and put on the bumper of my car. And then I go home and start to think of all I have to do today, of how no one knows of my daily struggles, of my momentary unrest, unhappiness of what I don't have, of what others might think of me. And you watch as I start to feel the venom inside me start to rise to the surface. I try to choke it back as I scream at my own children as if they committed another felony, say something staggeringly hurtful to my husband just to watch him reel, 
once more kill my mother with my words of ritual abandoned. Speak about the sins of my friends and neighbors, scream at the strangers on the highway, mistreat those I don't even know with the fangs of my terrorized judging eyes and the coldness of my distance. And you watch the trajectory of this happening every single day in the corner of my kitchen. Day in, day out, I speak of ending hunger to the solicitor on the phone. Put another check in the campaign to stop the violence. Hang my peace crane from the window. You sit without belief, shake your head at me while laughing. Just until you once again recoil in horror as you see me suddenly decide that the spider in the other corner of the kitchen is getting a little too close for comfort while I grab a piece of newspaper, roll it up, and snuff its life force out. A whole family gone in an apathetic instant of a moment. Every day you toe the line between constant fear and mockery as you coexist here with me in my kitchen. Mm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> She's really very nice, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, no spiders were harmed in the making of that poem? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> well, I think um, I, one thing that we were talking about yesterday that I love about poem making is the possibility for anthropomorphizing and for, uh, for shape-shifting. And any, and any of you who write songs or poems, you can go into another shape and think about what it would be like, and as you do, sort of compassionately putting you, your, your imagination into another shape. And that's sort of what I'm doing here. Mine is creepier. It, <laughs> it's called, The Spiders Are Sleeping. The spiders are sleeping, dreaming on hammocks tied across door frames or slung between dusty beams. One star croons a lullaby that throws a blue veil over the hickory. A bust of fluorescent in the cellar buzzes another. The moon runs the faucet of visions to lull, to lull them. And slowed in the catacombs, they tiptoe in eight counts, sipping the wriggling air, still hungry in their sleep. Now is the time to flee with your life's sweet juices parceled in the paper sack of your skin, your bones like green glass clinking. Now while they sleep there is no toll to cross the woven lanes and radial highways, no dark car in the turnoff clocking your escape. If you wish to go, resolve to be less present than a breeze, less substance than a hope, less than a whisper in the wires, sizzling in the air between houses. Discard what anchors or pins you, nails and cowardice, a dress book, toothbrush and nightmares. You pass only as a husk, the you that's left after a spider. You're safe only when your heart clambers back into the center of your arteries, black and hungry, a spider you carry everywhere. Then you can decide where to sling your web, when to wake, hunt, feed, and sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I thought maybe you might be a little weirded out by our spider poems. So I went and looked in t for quotes uh, on Google uh, ah, right. for spiders. And, uh, and spiders and people and the role of spiders and how they might look at each other. I did find this uh, one relevant quote, I believe, that I'd like to leave and the spider poems with. It's from Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> Our egos tell us we're the only ones that have any kind of feelings. We're the only ones with a relationship. We're the only ones with a family. You know, I think that if you kill a spider, there's a relationship that you're ruining. There's a conversation going on outside with the other spiders. Did you hear that about Chris? Killed, yeah, sneaker. <laughs> and now Stephanie has 900 babies to raise all alone. <laughs> oh, she's got her legs full, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Chris was so kind, wouldn't hurt a fly. It's just been tough for them lately. 
They just lost their web last week. <laughs> Gosh. Those humans think they're so smart. Let them try shooting silk out of their butt and see what they can make. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> We're not no. going to do that for you here either. <laughs> so don't worry. <laughs> Thank you for adding that, Kate. <laughs> you have to come to special tea parties <laughs> to <not> see that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so we move on to cheese. And uh, okay, so we said one day, probably feeling a little silly, let's write a poem about cheese. And so we did. And I'll just say that in thinking about cheese for me, well, you know, I had a long journey, kind of, and I thought about a foreign exchange student we loved who came to live with us for a bit from Ancy France, whose father was a distributor of uh, wonderful cheeses out there, and uh, how she had brought some for us. And it's called Veronique, who brings cheese from Ancy France. That sounds like ants in your pants. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, it darn, does, I didn't think of that before. <laughs> we'll have to fix that. <laughs> That's our next one. Answer in your pants. Next Friday. Okay. <laughs> Veronique. Her suitcase tells us that she has been to London, Paris, Florence, and Morocco. Little travel decals announcing departure and arrival, vacation after vacation. Veronique is staying at her suitcase side while her smile is saying more than she is able at this moment. How she is new to our land and she does not know our customs, our comfort in our language and how to get past feeling shy. Although she is well-traveled, she stands with her feet glued to the sidewalk, this telltale suitcase talking more than Veronique at the moment. Later on that day, Veronique speaks to us minimally her accent thick with romantic, stepping lightly over lavender in the fields type of French mm -hmm. that seems to almost sing its way from her lips. She tells us thank you for hosting her stay, and she hands us a chunk of her homeland from Ancy France, a hard, odd-smelling wheel of cheese, the cheese we all look at, as if moderator of languages ascends from its mass to tell of her country and of her life story. A few weeks later, Veronique becomes more comfortable in her surroundings. When we speak, she thinks she understands, as we are now speaking in slow, careful phrases to each other. But it's interesting how things like suitcases and eyes and smiles and wheels of odd-smelling cheese always seem to be much more proficient in saying more than we would ever dare. We learn this in the climax of her visit, when Veronique goes with us to the beach, which is packed with people. One sweltering Sunday in July, Juillet, and apparently she does not know about the American tradition of changing into her bathing suit beforehand, <laughs> or in the woman's shower room, or in the salle de bain. Instead, she stands up in the middle of the six by six foot space of overpopulated surf and sand, like close quarter tenement dwellers without the walls. <laughs> with a young couple alternating between chain smoking and French kissing on our right at one o'clock. <laughs> and the 12 year old giggling, tanky need girls blaring music on top of 40s, of the top 40s on a tinny sounding radio on our left at eight o'clock. And the blanket of busily ogling 20 something year old men at two o'clock. <laughs> up ahead who chart out the course of each potential, potential candidate of future Miss America beauty queen passerbys, based not on the words they might have to offer of life and contemplation, but more so based on their individual bikini niche presentations. And the tired older couple at seven o'clock on our left who only want to close their eyes, melt into their towels, rebaptize in the water, and then surface once again renewed, restored, and reborn. And Veronique rises above them all, phoenix bird, girl from Ancy, France. Limited language, coy petite smile, knowing and not knowing, she pulls a bath sheet about her like a privacy curtain before everybody's watchful eye. One hand on the towel, the other to slip off her items of clothing one by one, as if it's done by everyone all the time. <laughs> I believe the shocked audience about her is counting all the clothes that Veronique unrobes from. Underneath her towel, one, two, three, four. And then she 
proceeds to put on her bikini bottom, single-handedly with the other hand securely holding the towel around her in place, while she pulls on her stretch string bikini, topped the same way she can't resist in saying as if in grand finale conclusion, a demure exclamation of voila. <laughs> emerges from her towel curtain, a modern-day miracle fully transformed into bikini quicker than James Bond could ever try. Everyone about us now exhales deeply in amazed unison and westernized relief. The applause and the shock and bewilderment <laughs> is simultaneously there yet inaudible at how some can come so close to being just about publicly emperor, unknowingly naked, behind just a towel, using just one hand and effortlessly change into a suit like one is merely <laughs> trying to tie a shoe. There is now absolute silence in our 24 by 24 region of the beach, and then, when the silence finally breaks, the young men stop searching for Miss Bikini America and instead are now inspired to converse with each other in their never before used college French. <laughs> The 12-year-old girls stop their tittering and readjust their radio station to NPR, suddenly eager to learn all they can about the world. <laughs> the young couples put out their cigarettes and suddenly start to talk about plans for using the patch and perhaps saving their money instead for a trip to Paris where French kissing is most authentic. <laughs> and the older couple cross themselves and say a few Hail Marie's <laughs> with a slow spreading smile of salvation. We look back at Veronique's innocent foreign gaze. We don't say a thing. We are beyond words, but we are starting to understand. We smile slowly and instead offer to buy something for her to eat, akin to cheese. American style, perhaps a grilled cheese or steak and cheese or cheese fries or the inevitable beloved by France French fries. <laughs> When Marianne leaves to return to Auntie France, the big wheel of odd-smelling cheese is entirely gone, and we are thankful for all that was shared between us, said and unsaid, all that was learned about our similarities, all our differences through language, through behavior, and through that which is deeper within understanding each other and the world just perfectly through the language of things like smiles and suitcases and strategically put on bikinis and great big wheels of cheese. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> that <laughs> oh man well cheese. Uh, cheese i um this is a cheating poem cheese makes a cameo appearance and uh that was an important thing for us is saying that you don't have to actually there's there's no um, poem police thank heavens <laughs> so um you can dive off and and end up somewhere else and i ended up there's a woman that we know and i forget her name all the time you may know her, actually. She, she comes here. She actually works here. She's great. <laughs> and I should know her name. <sighs> and I'll, I'll forget it again now, even after I've read this publicly. I love her. She's a wonderful person. It's called On Second Meeting. Her name was Hibiscus, and I called her Hyacinth. <laughs> Lucky I didn't blunder straight into hydrangea. Such mistakes, kind friends say, mean so little. A taxed mind, a few hours shaved off the nightly eight. So many faces, each with its name. But might this not equal disdain for the world's multiplicity, its quirk and one-of-a-kindness? The next time we meet, will my mouth shape only flower? <laughs> there are those who have tree and not maple. Cheese and not Jarlsberg, <laughs> bird and not nuthatch. But let me not be one of them. Let me know nuthatch by its dove gray coat and its habit of upside down walking. Let me know Jarlsberg by its milk that tastes like the cows grazed on honey flowers and hazelnuts. Let me know maple leaf by its center vein that traces rivers and tributaries into the angled lobes. And when I see hibiscus again, let me conjure the crinkled salmon damask of those petals, the gold-frilled stamen leaning out like a glad woman in her doorway, waving to someone loved and unmistakable. <laughs> <laughs> to hibiscus. <laughs> to hibiscus. May we never forget her name. <laughs> Don't call her hydrangea. <laughs> and we love her. 
It's still my turn to start the next poem. It is, as it, ha as it happens. <laughs> yes, uh, and uh, we go on to plumage. Uh, I believe, Kate, you picked that one, that topic once. That's yeah, right about plumage. I don't know why I said plumage, but that's why, you know, donkeys, uh. Uh, these kinds of things. <laughs> but I remember when I was a kid, I had a book that said you could write a poem about ketchup and diamonds. Uh, and I thought, fabulous. Yeah. Of course you can. Mm -hmm. You know, anything. You right, so we did plumage. So we did plumage. And um, here's my poem for you. The Cardinal and the Cavemen. Cardinal, today you made my heart stop just for a moment. I was putting on the coffee, the new paper filter, the hazelnut flavored grinds, assembling for my morning ritual of first cup while looking out the kitchen window where my unknowing heart desired to be. Caveman that I am, just like every other one of us, we face our place of true origin mostly out the windows these days and think aloof puffs of thought like, Look at that sunrise in the distance, or how blue the sky today, or what a beautiful starlit night. Like it's all a mediocre painting out there with the mammoth rock and the sheltering spirits of trees, the whispering pools of water places, the movement within water, spinning circles to the surface, reminding of the herds of long ago distance galloping their wild thunder feet on dirt, of the days of dark warm shelter of our caves, the rough stiff fur of night blankets. Why don't we still feel all this up close, like we might feel the place of our first home of mother's womb? But instead we are now content to look out the window and think something like, isn't it a nice day out there today, like it's a distant country? But Cardinal this morning, there was the holy glimpse of you, blazing your glory of scarlet, tilting your little black mask of face as you once more take in the sky, as if it's your hourly meditation that I happen to catch sight of in my unthinking robotic daily ritual, which brought me instant hush, instant actual kneeling down praise to the forgotten beauty of our universal mother and these offerings of earthly treasures that all come from her giving womb that we are now often immune to truly seeing. You brought me this reminder. You brought me this instant gift of quiet hallelujah that started softly singing of this world's true firstborn beauty. It's right here, right now out that window, waiting for our eyes to stop their automated trajectory of the day to day, to look out, to gasp, to gaze, to hear a chorus of our echoed harmonic shoutings of those necessary hallelujahs ringing out loud from the doors of every home and every ancestor's cave. Hmm. Yeah. No much. <laughs> no <much>. Amen. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting the way uh, well, we have, as you can hear, really different styles, different approaches and everything, and yet at the same time, I think sometimes we correspond. I mean, I think both of us looked at plumage as a chance to say, bust out, everybody. Mm -hmm. And my poem is, is sort of about the way that we live as chickens when we could be living as peacocks. Mm -hmm. So don't, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's plumages. We've been wearing a winter coat like drab and tired feathers and an old beaten hat like a drooping crest. Gray days, gray skies, gray hearts. Barnyard birds of routine. Low horizons, chicken wire souls. We peck at what's given us. Why don't we wake up early tomorrow and catch the sun in the drop at the end of the drain pipe? Why don't we sing to the moon for a change and ask foxes to dance their tangos and wild tarantellas? And then let's change clothes with phoenixes and steal thunder from the peacocks. Then we'll stand arrayed in opal and emerald plumage, in scarlet and tangerine and pinions of azure and silver. Then we'll be kings and queens among daisies and irises, in poppy fields and thyme gardens, through the bluebells and even among the roses. Then we are the crested emblems of life in the air, life among flowers, life even in the barnyards and the crates off to market. 
Let's never take off these beautiful clothes. Thank you. My pleasure. Kate, let's go out and partay now. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we have one more poem, I think. We're um. nearly, we're nearly <laughs> up to the party. So we'll take you just for this last poem through the labyrinth. That was, I think you're right. I don't know whose idea labyrinth was anymore. Probably, was it me? Yeah. Hmm. So um, we have, what, what to say about labyrinths? I spent a lot of time, my father being sick in the hospital, and this, the hospital itself seemed like this labyrinth. And I thought a lot about the Minotaur and uh, that, the monster, and wondered about whose monsters. So the hospital labyrinth. There, in the gleaming halls, the endless bleached passages, I glimpsed him, the minotaur who eats your life. Great curved horns and shaggy head, the nostrils smoking with fury, he passed into post-op, and I slumped against a gurney, spared or unseen, hard to know, but had to keep moving as all sacrifices keep moving. Past stretchers and mops, past nurses' stations with their many phones and smells of popcorn and hand cream, past men loitering in wheelchairs, memorizing their hands, past darkened rooms like catacomb cells, past lit rooms with balloon airships anchored to IV stands, past televisions blabbing to empty chairs, past wrinkled heaps of magazines, corridors on lefts and rights, elevators up and down and past the start, loud staircases at either and neither end, doors that open one way and close again with a click. And all the time the snuffling and the heavy tread and the smell of wet fur, the puzzle of losing and regaining, so that I forgot if he pursued me or I looked obliquely for him. At last a door opened and ejected me into the sunlight into a courtyard garden of white tulips and daffodils pale as butter. What is the sacrifice, I wondered, as he touched my cheek, or I took his hand, hard to know? What is the sacrifice, I wondered, as life itself bellowed and thundered, onward, onward through the maze of my blood? So labyrinth for me in poem, I didn't have too many connections to labyrinth at the time. They seemed to come after I wrote the poem and then I became bombarded by news and labyrinths and how they are connected with spirituality and wellness and labyrinth walks uh, happening everywhere and I had a, a card deodorizer that had a labyrinth on it with a oh. wonderful quote and <laughs> labyrinths were everywhere but when we, I had this assignment uh, I didn't know too much about labyrinths uh, right then and there so you know I thought about the circular uh, movement of a labyrinth and uh, then what I next thought of was a recent drive I had uh, which was kind of like a labyrinth uh, where I, ha I was coming from a, a memorial service and I had a destination of getting over to Concord which doesn't sound too hard except I thought I'd take a shortcut and ended up getting very very lost in all these back roads uh, and so of course it made me very late for this meeting where I was supposed to be on time and um, and these uh, interesting course of events happened. So uh, that's what Labyrinth uh, in this poem became uh, that I decided to share. And the interesting thing was, as I was writing really about this car ride, uh, the poem uh, went beyond me in a way um, to also seem to be about the journey of life. Um, and so uh, please allow me f uh, to take you on my car ride. Uh, I apologize a bit for uh, the stops we take along the way. I need to do some editing, but that doesn't happen until summer. So. <laughs> <laughs> the other Saturday, I was driving to Concord, the once residence of Henry David Thoreau, who wrote, time is but a stream I go a-fishing in. 
except I had to be in Thoreau's timeless homeland in 30 minutes to some place that seemed like the most important destination at the time. I was supposed to be at someone's house for some important meeting, people waiting and counting on me with time as my patient rival. And so I zipped along, self-assured I could beat the time zone, although I may have left in my usual 10-minute late margin, having that sense of being able to control time rather than time controlling me. Pay attention to your surroundings. Driving along, spinning my wheels in the rural back roads of expatriate farmers, now ghosts with their homes modified to meet the demands of another beautiful suburbia, except for a few remnant dirty sheep looking at my car vacantly, a few cows standing idle in the field, two or three horses, an interesting juxtaposition with the new mansion homes between them and their standing fields mediated by the native daffodils standing as if to stretch and beam their yellow sunrise. Some children are riding bicycles standing still on their bikes as they approach the hills. I drive my car late but looking. I feel like I'm learning as I go. My car the pinball in this game where I bounce back and forth on these roads, gaining points, observations, realizations. I wonder, is this how Thoreau felt in his wilderness, amazed to see so much? Eventually I realize I have become very lost from my conquered destination, yet with each of these landmarks, I feel found. Take occasional deep breaths. I should know these back roads like the back of my hand, but I feel completely lost on this seemingly simple expedition. Where is Thoreau when I need him? <laughs> So I drive to the boundary between two towns filled with a sudden self-doubting, the sudden flooding of the shoulds. I should be on time, I should have brought a map, I should not be guessing, I should know where I am going. I should think before I act, I should know better by now, I should be better at everything now. Should, 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 should. Mm -hmm. All this because I am late on some unfamiliar back road, ready to have myself committed to some form of institution or at the very least some good therapy program somewhere. I come to a stop sign which tells me the obvious. Stop. <laughs> Be my own best friend. Continue on with the journey. Do the best I can. Pull over when I need to. Take a deep breath of this beautiful air we still have. We breathe into our lungs. We breathe it out, and so I breathe. Roll down the windows. Feel the sun stroke my face. Gentle breeze passing over me. Birds take turns singing solo. I still have to get to my meeting, the destination, but I realize the destination is all around me as well. Thank you. Thank you. Go slow. I see a sign for the main road in Concord, a kind greeting from ahead. The houses crowd toward me as I get closer to my destination. I begin to get a bit impatient, and I step on the gas in anticipation. And as I do so, I pass a police car hiding in the bushes of a driveway. <laughs> Seems he is waiting just for me, and he speeds up and puts the blue lights on. Reluctantly, I pull over and start to feel the defenses take over. Why me? I wasn't going that fast. What about all those other people out there? I was lost, just getting my bearings. Is that a crime? Just my luck, it's always me. <laughs> and as I face the police officer who comes to my window saying, good afternoon, ma'am, do you know how fast you were going? In a voice that is surprisingly tolerant, I realize he is right. I really was speeding. It was me going too fast, thinking I'm entitled to speed in this residential place, teeming today with all of these sights I've been celebrating, except when I'm late, and that's when I decide to hear a pain in the neck. Children wobbling on bikes, the happy shaggy dogs which might get loose, hyperactive squirrels doing the perpetual celebrating of life dance, the vulnerability of all this beautiful life, the officer asks me my destination, goes to his car, checks my record, comes back and gives me a warning and tells me to please go slow. No matter where I am going, nothing is that important. Mm -hmm. Respect one another. Now that I am finally in Concord and almost there, I find myself driving behind an elderly woman, driving slower than the cow I see that is strolling by in the nearby field. <laughs> The woman stops in the middle of the road to squint out the sign and accelerate slowly ahead to the next sign, seemingly oblivious to those behind her. At this moment, I would like to pass her doing 100 miles an hour, make her hair blow about wildly while I squeal my tires past. 
But it is the one behind me who changes this, a man in a monster truck, brown and tall like a T-Rex, blaring his horn at her, at me. I look in the mirror, hold up my hands to him, and he gets it. Or perhaps he sees her head, now trembling a bit more. She pulls over, sticks her hand to wave us past, doesn't know that I see her, give an ancient peace sign after we have gone by. <laughs> And I understand her, and the monster truck guy understands me. He pulls away from his horn. We all recoil in our understanding and journey on. Love. Now that I'm in Concord, I'm officially 35 minutes late. And when I come across the street sign that welcomes me to my destination, I am indeed finally here, although dreadfully, dreadfully late. But I am grateful to be here and grateful for all of it, this challenging, frustrating, unnerving, wonderful, breathtaking, incredible journey. As I pull into the parking spot, just waiting for me, feel the ethereal welcoming of the arms of others, the forgiveness always waiting, the love that is always waiting. The host takes me in her arms and hugs me warmly, tells me the meeting hasn't even gotten started. It seems I'm not alone. There are others who have been experiencing delays, and she's so glad to see me on this beautiful day. I realize it's not too late. It was not a perfect journey, but it was mine. It's unique twists and turns and sightings, the underground collective heartbeat which guides and directs the driving of us all. I see suddenly, fleetingly, where I was, why I'm here, to simply follow the heartbeat in this labyrinth of life. I step inside the door, take my seat, and join the meeting that has just gotten started. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, done. well, we'd like to thank you very much for listening to our poems today, and uh, mm. we think... We, we wanted to leave you with Labyrinth because maybe if, if, well, I know some of you are creating together that what you can be for each other is a person, if you know the myth of the Labyrinth, somebody holding the string on the outside and saying, go in there, and even though there is apparently a ferocious minotaur who might like to gore you, you'd be all right, you know, go in there and see what you find. <laughs> and that's where you find poems in the Labyrinth, so we hope that you'll maybe take a trip in there yourself with a good friend to hold the string. But we didn't want to really leave them at Labyrinth, did we? No, we didn't. We didn't. We want to leave you with something different. Um, this is a melding of poetry and music. And uh, I was challenged to make this piece by some friends who um, told me to try to write a new song in a genre in which I had never worked before, and this certainly fills the bill. Can we just um, move? Uh, can we move these, or do you need your podium? Nope. I can move mine. How do we? What do we do with them? Just over the side. We can. Move oh, them. okay. <gasps> oh, careful! This is on there. It seems so exciting when the there, in case we get crazy. I just wanted to say I've always wanted to share poetry and dance, and today I get to be Kate's backup dancer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kate. The charrette. <laughs> okay, ready? ready? All right. Go. Well, I'm a teapot. I'm always thirsty for tea. I like the leaf kind. No, not those bags that you buy. No, not the cheap kind. No stinking red rose for me. No, no salada. And I shoot the tetley. Shoot, shoot the tetley. Cause I'm a teapot. My hood is high on the shelf. Hang with my homies. Those be the teacups in Delft. I am munition. Is water hotter than hell? I'm in a physician. Is Earl Grey himself. Er Earl Grey himself. Cause I'm a teapot. I'm always thirsty for tea. I like the leaf kind. No, not those bags that you buy. No, not the cheap kind. No stinking red rose for me. No, no salada. And I shoot the telly. Shoot, shoot the telly. Cause I'm a teapot. The chicks are checking me out. They like my handle. They like my sensitive spout. I got a bevy. A loose leaf tea's on the go. Like mango ginger and little minty, you know. But the one who makes me whistle and blow is oh, oh, oh. Orange, orange pico, cause I'm a diva. I'm always thirsty for tea. I like the leaf kind. No, not those bags that you buy. No, not the cheap.
cheap kind. No stinky red rose for me. No, no salada. And I shoot the telly. Shoot, shoot the telly. Shoot, shoot the telly. Gangster tea pie. Woo, woo. Very fun. Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was really fun. I love the tea <laughs> Good dancing. <laughs>